We are on a constant rebalancing. We started 10 years ago on this journey on, on synchronization, but the journey evolves uh, every, every four to five years. We have to step back, look at what we're doing, what has changed. This rapid change that's occurred is very closely tied to the digitization of the supply chain as well. And that too is seemingly changing at a much more rapid pace today. Welcome to the Inside Forbes Council's podcast. Each episode shares transformative insights and advice from members of Forbes Councils, a group of invitation-only communities for successful executives and entrepreneurs. This is Inside Forbes Councils. Hi everyone, this is Stephen Ganoza. Welcome to Inside Forbes Councils. Today, we welcome back Stephen Bowen, Stephen is the CEO of Mainpoint, a global supply chain and operations consulting firm. Stephen led a discussion with Michael Burnett from the University of Tennessee's Global Supply Chain Institute and Josue Munoz, Vice President of Global Supply Chain Demand and Systems for Colgate Palmolive. They discussed supply chain synchronization, digitization, quickly accessing and acting on data, and how the pandemic has accelerated trends that were already in progress. Hello, everyone. It's really good to be back here with you. I'm Steve Bowen, the CEO at Mainpoint. We're a global supply chain and operations consulting firm, helping companies through a methodology we call total value optimization to be able to drive improved cost structures, cash flow, and really drive growth through the supply chain. And I'm very pleased to be a member of the Forbes Business Council and a pretty regular contributor to uh, Forbes.com, where we continuously uh, address a number of the current issues. And what is happening in today's world with this whole aspect of supply chain is a pretty interesting topic that we want to focus on today with a couple of guests, and I'll introduce them in just a moment. And we're going we're gonna to focus on the end-to-end -end supply chain synchronization and a way to orchestrate a winning strategy. And it's my pleasure to be here today with two people, Mike Burnett from the University of Tennessee and the Global Supply Chain Institute. Welcome, Mike. Thank you, Steve. It's good to be here. And also joining us today is Josue Munoz, and he comes to us from Colgate Palmolive as Vice President of the Global Supply Chain Demand and Systems at Colgate Palmolive. Josue, thank you for joining us today. Uh, Steve, thanks for having me here. So in this, in this process of, of going through this conversation, what I would like to do, Mike and Jose, is just address a few issues around why synchronization is so important to the overall supply chain. And I think one of the most important aspects of synchronization is, first of all, to perhaps put some definition around this. So Mike Burnett, you've just you've done papers in the past on this topic and a more recent paper on this topic. How is it that the Global Supply Chain Institute defines synchronization of the supply chain? Well, Steve, let me let me make two different points here. First of all, we, as you know, at the Institute, we interface with hundreds of companies every year. And we had created this hypothesis that the best of the best supply chains or the benchmark supply chains we're using end-to-end -end synchronization as their primary supply chain strategy, and in many cases, a business, a more multifunctional business strategy. Um, so we uh, decided to uh, develop some applied research on that, and the hypothesis centered around that the benchmark companies had largely completed implementing the capability of lean platform management, external collaboration, and end-to-end -end integration. And in our research, we actually found that to be true uh, that the the best of the best were working on synchronization. It's kind of what I call like a dirty little secret because we don't want to talk about this out loud too much. But um, so so we did confirm that 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 is a primarily. Now this this learning from synchronization is not just for benchmark companies because really for the average supply chain, learning from the best is a really effective technique uh, to improve the capability of your supply chain. And in this, we found that the benchmark companies, the second point is that synchronization is when the company defines the core business driver, that thing that drives the most total value for their company and links that with the physical 
supply chain, the business processes, and the people systems or the culture. And when the capability, capacity of the physical supply chain business processes and people is synchronized with the core business driver, then the total value for the, for the enterprise is optimized. Well, that's a really great definition, Mike. And I think, uh, you know, this is a opportunity for us to perhaps talk to one of the companies in Colgate Palmolive and particularly with Josue today um, with a with an organization that has been very much on this synchronization pathway um, probably for quite a few years. So, Jose, I, I'm particularly interested in how has Colgate Palmolive made use of supply chain synchronization strategies and uh, in an opportunity to really improve your overall supply chain on a continuous basis? Well, yes, uh, as you said, we started our, our synchronization journey uh, almost uh, 10 years ago. And uh, it was after a realization that the only way we were going to be able uh, to provide better service to our customers and our consumers to continue to deliver uh, around our efficiency goals and our savings goals and continue to be a, a very good supply chain was synchronizing. And, uh, and, and, and synchronizing one word, uh, but it is not easy. It, it starts, uh, as, as, as uh, Mike said, with uh, understanding what has to drive your supply chain, but then being able to connect all the elements of your supply chain and making sure that all, all those elements respond in unison to those signals that uh, come out uh, from the environment and the commercial environment, the commercial team, the consumer, the customer. And um, to me, it all starts with data uh, and, and making sure that, that, that your data is aligned and you have a, a solid data architecture. Uh, it is the use of technology and making sure that you have the technology that allows you to drive visibility and then the people and the processes that are then synchronized to respond in unison to the signals that the company receives. Well, I'm just curious, Jose, is there any particular area um, that you've seen some of the biggest uh, successes or perhaps lack thereof as you've uh, made your way through this very complex environment of physical process and people, not only inside of Colgate, but also with your, your partners? I, I think there's been an evolution uh, in, in, in our business with our partners and, and, and the importance of sharing information and, uh, and, and providing visibility. Uh, I remember years ago, uh, it, it was more difficult when you talk to, to retailers and wholesalers, distributors on, on, on sharing information and looking at the supply chain as a single supply chain and not breaking it supplier, customer, but looking at it as a whole. Uh, this has evolved. And, uh, and so that has allowed us to better integrate systems and to better integrate signals with customers and suppliers. And that allows us for better synchronization. Okay. Well, Jose, bringing that into a little bit more current situation of this global pandemic that's occurred, that's heightened, I, I would say both risks and I suspect unfolded some opportunities. Any perspectives that you might add to the results in association with the ability for Colgate Palmolive to deal with this very dynamic pandemic situation? I think that you just, the word is dynamic and, and volatile. And, uh, and, and I think it, 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 it's interesting because uh, uh, we've implemented technology that on an everyday basis works extremely well. But uh, when the volatility got to the levels that it, that it got to when the pandemic started, uh, we started to see some cracks, and uh, and and so uh, so we need uh, now to come back and, and and review what are the things that we have to redesign and and uh, and look at differently because uh, it might happen again, and uh, and if we're not prepared, we won't be as resilient as we need to be. So so I think that this volatility uh, has shown us that some of the processes that that worked very well and were designed. For, for normal situations did not respond as well as we needed when the volatility went through the roof. Right, and I, I think uh, everyone seems to be searching, Jose, you, you said for normal situations of what this new normal is going to be like, 
What insights might you share on what you foresee for Colgate Palmolive in, in the new normal? Well, I, I, I think it, it varies by category. As you know, we're, we, we have many categories and compete in many and many geographies uh, globally. And, and so it is not exactly the same across the world. Uh, I do believe that there are categories that, uh, that consumption is going just to go up as, as, uh, as consumer behavior will change and adapt. And, and we're seeing that in, in cleaning and products uh, for the home and for the body. And, and so there, uh, that's going to put a lot of pressure on, on our supply chain to, to maintain those uh, capacity levels to deliver against that increased consumption. Other mm -hmm. categories in which we saw uh, increases are going back to normal, and those will probably not change. Again, everything is driven by consumer behavior, and that's, and that's what's going to uh, drive the, uh, the, the new reality moving forward. And, uh, and honestly, I think we, we have to wait and see. We don't know where everything will settle and how behaviors will change, and, and, and those behaviors will change consumption, which in the end is what we have to deliver against. Right, right. Well, no doubt it's going to continue to be dynamic with this consumer behavior change. I'm just curious if I might shift gears just a moment, Jose, I'll be right back to you. But Mike, what, what other uh, insights might you have in this you know, climate today with this global pandemic that you've seen of uh, disruptions or vulnerabilities for companies Maybe it goes beyond just this consumer packaged goods industry where you have some insights on those risks. Well, Steve, we we found that <clears throat> largely there's kind of two camps. The, the camp that the pandemic has exploded the demand and also increased the demand variation significantly. And we found the camp that where the, you know, the demand has dried up. So let's talk for a second about the exploded demand. Um, the core the the primary challenge has been that the the enterprise has to run at 110 percent of capacity and when you're stressing your end-to-end -end supply chain you learn where the defects are in the supply chain now not dissimilar to the other research we've done most of those defects fortunately or unfortunately are with the partners in the supply chain uh, typically, most companies like Colgate and others, they're, they're in internal manufacturing and warehouse operations works pretty well. But that if they have a defect and they can't supply that product, it's centered around either a supplier or a other partner in the system. So this whole concept of understanding your end-to-end -end supply chain is vital, being able to map that out, because in some cases, the company was surprised that, that that the supply chain even operated in the way that they, they learned when they found the uh, defect. So that's one thing. Uh, secondly, what we're finding is people are redefining capacity. Uh, before this time, uh, most companies define capacity as 100% of, of equipment utilization or you know taking the speed of the equipment, design rate, that type of thing, and calculating capacity. Well, the better that you understand your core business driver, you may need largely in those cases you need more capacity than you thought that you needed and uh so how we calculate capacity in many of these companies is 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 changing uh, uh how that capacity is calculated and then secondly just how we think about the word dependability and reliability uh, we have sophisticated measures in our manufacturing systems but that's not where we're seeing the majority of the defects so we have to look at these measures in a different way when we're talking about end to end and then obviously in the other side of the of the the um, equation when the demand has gone down how can the supply chain get involved and help as a value stream versus just looking at the supply chain but getting into new processes like new product development and other um, uh, needs that can help create this demand and how can the the capability of supply chain accelerate that work so so we can get that demand kindled and, and running again Right. Well, you know, that that demand and that internal capacity, as you spoke about, I'm sure, Josue, you you've had some capacity issues as you've gone through this experience. What insights might you share around managing uh, the capacity bottlenecks, be that whether it be manufacturing or transportation or anything in that end to end supply chain? Yeah, I, I think that uh, uh, what, what's important is your ability to react. And in, in, in this situation, uh, there were so many moving parts, and uh, and and what initially was thought to be reliable suddenly turned unreliable. So, 
uh, issues in transportation and in, in, uh, in ocean uh, freight, uh, changing lead times, blank sailings increased, uh, suppliers then had exactly the same issues because they had to get raw materials and, and they were seeing that those problems are suppliers also the logistics became an issue for them to deliver to our plants. And, and so all those moving parts created a, a situation in which the, the communication and the connection among all the parties in the supply chain ha had to increase. And, uh, and that was the only way for us to be able to, to deliver uh, the capacity and the production that, that, that was required and, and, and we could plan for. Uh, on the other hand, when, when you see an increase in demand that doubles, uh, honestly, I don't think that any well-ran supply chain would be able to react because if you're able to react to those levels of, of, of demand shifts, you basically had uh, assets that were idle, which, which make your, your, your supply chain inefficient. So, so uh, as, as we look into the future and how to become resilient, uh, we're going to have to create a network that allows us to find backup uh, if needed. And that means finding partners that might have uh, capacity that is idle, which will probably never uh, be enough when, when, when a demand doubles, but, uh, but find many of them that we could tap into uh, to be able to react. And, and as I said before, that, that is forcing us to relook at, uh, at our whole supply chain design, um, to put more weight into resiliency in the design of the supply chain, uh, to find ways to quantify what this resiliency means so that it makes sense to invest if that's what we need to do and uh, and and then move forward and and, and create the, those networks and 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 those cap and that capacity that we might need if something like this happens again right right well i i think for our audience that's a really interesting perspective of being able to bring this aspect of resiliency yet driving this from a perspective of total value for the organization. And there is, it is a balancing act, like you said, uh, Josue. And I, I, I just am curious about in this regard, I'll go to Mike first, and I would love to get your comments on this for Colgate Pamala too, Josue. As, as people have moved through this, we've heard a lot of discussion about, and particularly within the, uh, the paper that you did recently, Mike, there was sort of a, a discussion around a three-part response uh, from this this overall strategy consideration, yes, but underneath of that, sort of a stabilize a stabilize or stabilization. I've heard that with many different clients, recovery, and then rebalancing of this supply chain to drive these longer term aspects. Can you just comment a little bit on this very complex world we're in, in the short term as well as the long term uh, needs? Yes, yeah, Steve. Uh We've seen this three-phase model in all of our discussions, particularly with the benchmark companies, where they, uh, you know, you first you have to stabilize, and then you have to, you know, make that improvement. But they're anxious to get to phase three, where they can reapply the learnings. And I love uh, Josue's comments there. You know, how should we think about capacity in a different way? Because obviously, we don't want to just buy a bunch of capacity we're not going to use. But how are we prepared? How do we create agility? and responsiveness in the end-to-end -end supply chain and then use other techniques, whether that's um, um, latent capacity or other things, so that we can meet this. So the, the, the benchmark companies are busy at redefining dependability, redefining capacity. Honestly, they, they're using this opportunity to do a complete cultural renewal. You know, the it, it kind of goes hand in hand with the fact that the baby boomers are retiring. You know, we have an explosion of, of changes in our customers with Amazonification online and so forth. A lot of mega trends are being busted at this point. And when the, you overlay the pandemic of that, our organizations largely are not capable of fully meeting the business needs. So they're using this pandemic as an opportunity for renewal not only in their work processes, the physical supply chain, but also the organization. Right. Well, in that in that light of that using this this stabilize and recover to lead to rebalancing, I'm just curious, Josue, how how have you gone about uh, dealing with that? Has there been a war room? What what have you done at Colgate Pamala to deal with the short term as well as the long term? Well, uh, on 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 this on on this short 
term. It, it, it was uh, it was war rooms. Uh, it was uh, 24 seven hands on. It was a uh, deeper connection with 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 all our, our partners, uh, suppliers, uh, logistics providers, uh, customers, and, and, and making sure that that communication across all the supply chain uh, was as efficient as, as possible. And, uh, and that has allowed us to respond very effectively to, to, to the high volatility and, 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 and the complex situation that we've been living through. Um, on, on the rebalancing, it is interesting because as, as, as I look at, at, at what our history has been in the supply chain, uh, we are on a constant rebalancing. Uh, as I said, we started 10 years ago on this journey on, on synchronization, but the journey evolves uh, every, every four to five years. Uh, we have to step back, look at what we're doing, what has changed. And, and Michael mentioned that the, the whole commercial environment is changing. The needs of our customers and our consumers are changing. So we are on an ongoing basis reviewing what we need to do differently and, and, re, and readjusting our journey to be able to deliver against those needs. So, uh, and we were in the middle of doing that when, when this whole pandemic started. And right. so, so, so what, what we did was we took the learnings and, and, and the situation and, and we're adjusting our, our map for the next five years. Uh, and, and, and as I said, it's almost every three to every four years, we, we step back, we look at our journey and we redefine what has changed and, and, and we adjust uh, because, because the world is changing very, very fast uh, with, with, with the boom of e-commerce, which what happened right now is that what the, the acceleration that we expected in five to eight years happened in months. So, so, so it's a totally new reality and, and, and we need to make sure that our supply chain delivers against this new reality. Well, I think that raises a good point for maybe us to kind of pull this together around is this rapid change that's occurred is very closely tied to the digitization of the supply chain as well. And that too is seemingly changing at a much more rapid pace today. So Jose, maybe you want to start and Mike, you could add to and cap that off of what, what, how are you keeping up with that digitization change as well as all of these other dynamics you've been discussing for the past few minutes? Uh, and synchronization will be driven by, by, by technology, by people, and, and by process. And the technology is absolutely critical. And, and a digital, being digital, is it what drives accuracy and what drives speed. And, uh, and so, so this has just shown that we have to move faster. If we thought we were going to be able to take five years in, in, in a journey to digitize our supply chain, uh, to digitize our, our engagement with, with suppliers and, 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 and service providers, to digitize our engagement with, with our customers, uh, we cannot take that long now. And, uh, and the sense of urgency is, is really, really high. And so we have to make sure that uh, we refocus our investment to accelerate that digitization of the supply chain. Because if, if that doesn't happen, we're, we're, we're going to be left behind. And if any of our competitors does it, it will put us at disadvantage. So for us, it is absolutely clear that being digital and not only the supply chain, the whole company is, is, is critical. And, and that's one of our key priorities that, uh, that, that is now top of mind because we have to make sure that we leverage technology, leverage data, eliminate manual work, eliminate redundant processes. Uh, to be more efficient, more more agile, and and be able to deliver what our consumer and our customers need. Uh, Steve, I'll I'll add a couple points to this, and and one thing I do want to mention is, I think it's self evident, uh, Hostway and Colgate's passion for continuous improvement, and this is a characteristic of all high performing supply chains and enterprises. So, uh, that's obviously one of the best practices in the applied research, but. You you know, all supply chains, you have to be curious and you have to have a passion and drive to improve. Um, secondly, on this digital piece, I want to, obviously this is important, data, data analysis, decision making, artificial intelligence, all those types of things, as well as equipment that can, that can operate in a connected world. But I want to give you an example of one of the benchmark companies. They had determined that consumption, not shipments, 
not customer shipments, was the core business driver. And I would argue for many like CPGs and others, consumption is the core business driver. Now, obviously, these companies have been operating and, and, and synchronizing their supply chain to shipments, but they were able to use digital data analysis, a massive sets of data, to show that their consumption was relatively flat. But their shipments variation was was swinging all over the place. Well, with this data capability, the digital capability, they were then able to determine what level of variation was driven from the customer in in you know in temporary price reductions, promotions, those kinds of things, and what percent was driven by the, their commercial community and how they marketed the products and sold the products. And as you might guess, they found hundreds of millions of dollars of value creation and savings potential from moving closer to consumption. Now, we're not going to go 100% to consumption because it's hard for us to get, you know, past our shareholders that want those quarterly quarterly numbers. But the beauty of this analysis was to look at what that variation is costing so you can make conscious choices about how you deal with your customer practices or influence them by partnering with them, and then how do you deal with your own commercial practices? Well, Josue and Mike, thank you so much for all of your inputs and insights. Just as we close out here, would you leave our listeners with a, a final thought that you'd share around synchronization and this whole pandemic situation? Uh, Steve, again, thanks Thanks for having me here. I think that the, the subject of of synchronization is is absolutely key and it is important to any supply chain that wants to be successful and uh, and the more that we're able to share among uh, all, all supply chain peers on, on what we are doing and how we can improve our supply chains in the end there will be benefits for 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 all of us for all our consumers and uh, and for everybody that uses uh, any product that today is made around the world by all the supply chain professionals so uh, thanks for having me here. Thank you. Mike? Steve, uh, again, I want to thank you for uh, inviting me to participate. Uh, similar to Josue, uh, there's a lot of, uh, of knowledge and best practices being shared, uh, starting to be shared on synchronization. I encourage everyone uh, to be curious and, and dive into that and see what you can apply to your supply chain. Uh, you know, some of those key areas are, are digital capability, making sure the foundation is right, making sure that you've defined yourself as end to end and and getting into these uh, mega trends that we're having that are really dramatically shifting our business, including things like the pandemic and, and creating that capability in your supply chain so that you can deliver the business needs. Well, again, Mike. And Burnett and Jose Munoz, thank you both for joining us here today to shed a bit of light into the synchronization and, and digitization challenges that have been accelerated and highlighted by the pandemic. And, you know, in that end, for all our listeners, there's an opportunity to continue this uh, uh, discussion by uh, perhaps connecting up with the white paper that was recently written by the Global Supply Chain Institute called End-to-End -End Supply Chain Synchronization, Orchestrating a Winning Strategy. And that is available on both the Global Supply Chain Institute's website in their research page and also on the Main Point website. And in addition to that, this podcast, as, along with our entire series that we've done for Forbes around supply chain is available as well on both the main point website and through the inside Forbes council page on iTunes, Spotify, and Google play. So with that, I just want to say thank you to Mike and Jose and to all of our listeners for joining in on this really important and ongoing discussion around synchronization and digitization of the end to end supply chain. Thank you very much. If you'd like to hear more about supply chain management, you get into that complacency uh, as a business for such a long time, uh, you're not necessarily looking out and, and looking for new partners. And that's what we found here at SunMade is that we needed to open the team's eyes up to. There's a lot of other uh, partners out there or a lot of folks within the vendor community that would very much like the opportunity to work with a, a business uh, with the size and scale that SunMade has. If you haven't already, check out episode 59, where Steve Bowen talks with Harry Overly, the CEO of SunMade, about the brand strength of the iconic red boxes of raisins, complacency in product development, 
improving internal collaboration, and of course, how a focus on end-to-end -end supply chain management drives innovation, product development, and profitability. Well, that's all we have for today. As always, thank you so much for listening. Be sure to subscribe, and we'll see you on the next episode. This has been Inside Forbes Councils. Please be sure to subscribe to us on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you're a member of the Forbes Councils and would like to participate in our podcast series, please email your member concierge. If you're interested in joining a Forbes Council, learn more at ForbesCouncils.com.